सब्सक्राइब कीजिए धे आई चैनल को और बेल आइकन को दबाइए लेटेस्ट वीडियो सबसे पहले देखने के लिए COVID-19 has been a topic of serious concern around the world. Scientists and researchers are working hard to find its cure, symptoms, transmission, presence on different surfaces, and the agents of its transmission. Recently, the New York Times has reported that 239 scientists from 32 countries have consented on that the virus causing COVID-19 can remain airborne for a period of time and thus transmit itself. The scientists have presented a paper named It is Time to Address Airborne Transmission of COVID-19, which will soon be published in a scientific journal. In today's edition of our DNS, we will learn about what the scientists have to say about the presence of virus of COVID-19 and its presence in the air. The scientists from 239 countries have researched about the virus causing COVID-19 and its presence in the air. They have outlined the evidences showing that smaller particles present in the air can infect people. They are calling for the agency that is the WHO to revise its recommendations. A respiratory infection such as COVID-19 is transmitted through droplets of different sizes. When the droplets particle are larger than 5 to 10 microns in a diameter, they are referred to as respiratory droplets. If they are smaller than 5 microns in diameter, they are referred to as droplet nuclei. The WHO states, according to current evidences, COVID-19 virus is primarily transmitted between people through respiratory droplets and contact routes. In WHO's viewpoint, droplets containing the virus produced during speech, coughing, sneezing, etc. are larger than 5 to 10 microns in diameter, which, due to gravity, fall to the ground after traveling less than one meter. The 239 scientists, on the other hand, are citing evidences that the virus can be present in droplet nuclei, which are less than 5 microns in diameter, that do travel distances longer than one meter and can remain in the air for a longer period of time. If the scientists are correct and the evidences provided by them are established, it will mean that the risk of transmission is higher than previously thought. According to WHO, airborne transmission may be possible in specific circumstances and settings. These include settings in which procedures that generate aerosols are performed, endotracheal intubation, bronchoscopy, open suctioning, administration of nebulized treatment, manual ventilation before intubation, turning a patient to the prone position, disconnecting a patient from the ventilator, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, trachostomy, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Referring to the New York Times report, the WHO has stated that initial findings need to be interpreted very carefully. If the evidence is being cited has to be examined, researchers will look at the specific settings in which the virus was found airborne, the duration for which the virus was found staying in the air, and, most importantly, whether the virus continues to be infectious throughout this duration. There have been various studies done and evidences collected by the researchers before claiming the coronavirus can be an airborne transmission. One of the first studies, which was published in Nature, 
was conducted in two hospitals in Wuhan. It investigated that aerodynamic nature of the virus SARS-CoV-2 by measuring its viral RNA in aerosols. The study found that the concentration of the virus in aerosols detected in isolation ward and ventilated patient rooms was very low, but it was higher in the toilet areas used by the patients. Levels of airborne SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the most public areas was undetectable, except in two areas that were prone to crowding. In the month of April, a correspondence published in NEJM by researchers from the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases evaluated the stability of SARS-CoV-2 in aerosols on different surfaces. It was found that SARS-CoV-2 remained viable in aerosols throughout the duration of the experiment that lasted for three hours. The result indicated that aerosol and fomite transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is plausible since the virus can remain viable and infectious in aerosol for hours. WHO disagreed with the findings of NEGM article saying that the findings of COVID-19 virus in aerosol particles up to three hours does not reflect a clinical setting in which aerosol generating procedures were performed that is, this was an experimentally induced aerosol generating procedure. In the month of May, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC published a study titled High SARS-CoV-2 Attack Rate Following Exposure at Acquired Practice. The researchers who studied superspreading events found that following 2.5-hour choir practice attended by 61 persons, including a symptomatic index patient, 32 confirmed, and 20 probable secondary COVID-19 cases occurred, three patients were hospitalized and two died. The study noted that the act of singing might have contributed to transmission through the emission of aerosols, which is affected by the loudness of vocalization. Certain people are super emitters who release more aerosol particles during speech than others might have contributed to this and previously reported COVID-19 super spreading events. Aerosol emission during speech has been correlated with the loudness of vocalization and certain persons who release an order of magnitude more particles than their peers have been referred to as super emitters and have been hypothesized to contribute to super spreading events members had an intense and prolonged exposure singing while sitting 6 to 10 inches from one another, possibly emitting aerosols. If all these claims made by the scientists are established, then wearing a mask will become more essential than ever. It might be possible that N95 masks, which are used by clinicians in hospital settings, could now be recommended to prevent aerosol transmission subject to availability and depending on the health condition of a person.